lots of Thank you. Lots of folks that have uh, signed up for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and put everybody that's not going to be speaking on mute. That way um, we're not. But uh, if you guys have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Or um, we are also going to be live on Facebook uh, and YouTube. So so Corey has, has um, shared the YouTube with our Facebook as, and then also we're going to be on YouTube. So if you prefer not to be on camera for those things, um, just um, put yourself off camera. Just want to mention that um, moving forward. Um, I'm Jillian Graber, the Executive Director of Protect PT, and we are joined by Russell Garbo tonight. Um, if we want to go ahead and go to the next screen, it's got a little bit about who we are. Um, thank you all for joining us. Okay, Corey, we'll just go to the, the next slide. Sorry about that. Corey's trying to multitask. He's our <laughs> the guy on the back end here, um, making sure that every all the tech is working properly. So thank you, Corey, for doing that. And thank you, Chelsea, for helping out as well tonight and, and for all the wonderful slides you put together. Um, so, uh, so we have a little bit about who Clean Air Council is. Um, they're an environmental health advocacy organization fighting for everyone's right to a healthy environment. And um, we, we at Protect PT have worked with the council for a long time. Um, so we're really happy to, to continue that partnership this evening. Um, and so Russell, just a little bit about him. He has been an advocate for the Clean Air Council since 2012. And he helps residents in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey communicate uh, with government reg um, regarding environmental issues. He has a bachelor's degree in government with a minor in anthropology from College of William and Mary in Will Williamsburg, Virginia. And um, Rush Russell is passionate about all things air, water, and waste, which is uh, I have found to be totally true <laughs> in the time that, that we have worked together. Um, and uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit about Protect PT, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring the resident safety, security, and quality of life by engaging in education and advocacy to protect economic, environmental, and legal rights of people in Westmoreland and Allegheny County. So much smaller than, than folks there at Clean Air Council or a grassroots organization. Um, I'm the executive director and uh, one of the co-founders of the organization. And we're really excited um, to have you guys here tonight to join us for this webinar. Um, so go ahead to the next screen. And we're gonna keep letting folks in. Corey, I'm gonna have you do that um, while, uh, while we're recording. Um, okay, so just a kind of little overview of what we're gonna go over tonight. Um, first, we're gonna rev uh, do a review of fracking and, and kind of what we're talking about here, uh, what type of infrastructure we're talking about. Uh, we're gonna talk about oil and gas pollution. What is it and why is it dangerous? Um, what the methane rule is. Uh, we're here really to talk about the EPA methane rule and what does the rule, what does this rule affect? How does it affect you as an individual? Um, we're also gonna talk about, you know, what could be improved in this proposal. And so if you uh, plan to make comments, which are, are due um, here in February, um, we, we encourage you to add some of this stuff into your comment. We're gonna teach, teach you how to do that. How, how can you make comments on these things? Um, and so we're gonna talk about what needs to be strengthened and what recommendations should be made into the rule. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some of the, the cool stuff that's in there now that, that folks like Russell had a part in making sure we're included in the rule. And uh, finally, how can you get involved um, and how can you make sure that your voice is heard uh, for this um, federal rule? Uh, so, you know, kind of a rare opportunity to comment on a federal um, policy. So go ahead to the next screen, Corey. All right, so we have a little infographic here for you, um, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. You might hear the word compressor station, you might hear the word drill rig, you, you know, and so there's a lot of different ways that emissions can happen, um, you know, with the drilling oper and um, fracking operations. Um, you know, whether it's the extraction point, which is the actual site that is being drilled and fracked, to um, all along the pipeline, um, anywhere there is a valve or fitting or station where the pipes go into, at any point, there could be a leak. There could be emissions. Um, there are pigging operations, which are um, places where 
um, natural gas, um, you know, uh, pipelines get cleaned and things like that. Uh, and we're going to talk about those big emitters. Um, so like compressor stations, like is in the background here. This is actually the Tonkin's compressor station here in Westmoreland County, Murraysville area, and something that we commented on. And thanks to the help of Russell, we were able to make a good comment on um, the some of the different changes that are happening at that compressor station, which has been leaking. Um, and so we're going to talk about how this methane rule will help for things infrastructure like this going forward. Go ahead to the next screen. All right, so Russell, I'm going to let you take the reins here and we're going to, you know, we're going to engage and have this conversation. If folks have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, if there are people live that are uh, joining us live, you can go ahead and put your live questions in the chat as well, and we'll try to make sure we get to those too. So go ahead, Russell, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jillian. Everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I like this picture. Um, I actually think it's pretty similar to the cartoon we saw in the previous slide. You can sort of uh, match up all of the equipment here to the equipment in that cartoon. This is a real natural gas extraction point in Western PA. And I would say this is about a mid-sized one. It's not small, but it's not especially large either. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Corey. Okay, so why do we care about all of this is because natural gas extraction creates large amounts of air and water pollution um, on local scales, on global scales, um, all from the same pollution source. It, it's very complicated to think about and we always compare it to uh, pollution from coal fired power plants and coal mining in that was easier to understand at a certain level. So we're talking about a lot of different air and water pollutants but they're all coming out of the same stream. This is all called, you know, quote unquote, natural gas. It is all in the same, you know, it's all just coming out of the ground. Um, it's largely methane, uh, but there are other chemicals involved in there. Volatile organic compounds and then known carcinogens like benzene. And one of the really complicated aspects of this is methane itself is a potent greenhouse gas. So it is having effects at the global level in terms of its contribution to climate change. As it says on the slide, it is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, so obviously that's happening at a global level. Volatile organic compounds are creating smog at a regional level, uh, smog, AKA ground level ozone. Um, there's actually not a ton of research about local formation of ground level ozone also known as smog. And I'm not sure if people are aware of how that chemical reaction transpires, but volatile organic compounds literally react in heat in the atmosphere to form ground level ozone. Ground level ozone is not emitted from cars or trucks or any other industrial process. And it's literally a O atom jumping off of a volatile organic compound and then bonding with oxygen which is O2, to create the chemical compound O3, which is harmful smog, ground level ozone. Um, and I always think that's a really interesting part of our world is that oxygen quickly transforms. O2 is oxygen, vitally necessary for all life on this planet, turns into O3, a dangerous air pollutant to, to, to breathe. So that's how quickly all this happens. And then there's also known carcinogens, um, also known as hazardous air pollutants or air toxics. And benzene is one of the more common uh, air toxics out there. Um, and again, the, uh, the point about how fracking has increased air pollution compared to conventional gas drilling, it makes sense because fracking is a more aggressive form of gas drilling. Uh, we showed that initial slide. With hydraulic fracturing, you are literally electrocuting the ground, pumping it full of water and other corrosive chemicals, and then sucking it all back up. Um, this is just more aggressive than conventional natural gas drilling, 
and therefore it creates more air pollution. And Pennsylvania is the second largest gas producing state behind Texas, um, actually growing a little bit faster than Texas is. So we're perpetually anticipating that Pennsylvania could surpass Texas at one point. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Corey. Uh, so this is another, this is a kind of a scary graphic of some content at a natural gas site. I believe this is a flare of a glycol dehydrator, um, which is an excess chemical. There's certain processing that it doesn't, gas just doesn't come out of the ground and then reach your home. There's various processes that go into making it a commercial product. And a lot of times these sort of the substances they don't want involved in the natural gas stream, they just sort of burn off. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, I see a question in the chat. Um, that is an excellent question. It is really, we usually stick with that 87 times over 20 years. Um, I do not know. I mean, I'm sure that you're correct in that if it's more concentrated over 20 years, it would probably be more concentrated over five. Um, but we usually use that 20 year metric just to keep it simpler for people. Um, could you move on? Um, so again, we talked about the different chemicals that are in natural gas and those different chemicals create different health effects. Um, methane contributes to global warming VOCs, volatile organic compounds, contribute to smog formation, which has respiratory effects on you. And then uh, hazardous air pollutants like benzene can cause a whole host of health effects. And we are really at that point in terms of the history of natural gas drilling, where we're starting to learn about those health effects. You know, it, it takes the medical community a little while to catch up. Um, and Hydraulic fracturing and fracking really took off in Pennsylvania in the late aughts, um, 2008, 2009, definitely with the uh, Governor Corbett's administration, uh, which I believe he was elected in 2011 or 12. Um, and that was really when it took off and has been increasing ever since then. And it has taken that 10 or 20 years for the medical community to catch up and contribute to that whole host of health effects. And I wanted to bring up at this point, we we throw we talk about hazardous air pollutants. We say many chemicals on this slide, it says benzene, toluene, hydrogen sulfide, all these other things. Um, and it's so complicated in the gas stream that even at certain points, the industry claims that they cannot, there's a word uh, that comes up in gas permitting that says, unable to speciate hazardous air pollutants. And it means that it, it, a certain stream, they literally can't figure out if it's benzene or toluene or some of these other chemicals. Um, and that still appears in permits that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection writes. Um, so that just tells you how complicated this whole situation is. Yeah. This might be even a little easier because I won't have yeah. to ask. That's great. Oh, yeah. Um, but I will Thank say, I will, I will now not be able to see the chat. Um, so That's Jillian, okay. I can yeah, see just interrupt it. Me. Absolutely. I will. All right. <laughs> okay. Before we move on, does anybody have, this is probably a good time to, if anybody has questions right now, that question about the potency of methane is an excellent question. Yeah, for uh, sure. I wanted to mention too something that that we talk about when when we're you know talking to folks about natural gas, um, uh, and we, we say we say oil and gas development. Um, you know, in local hearings, we hear a lot. Oh, you know, there's no health impacts, and and there's so much data to back up the health impacts. Um, and uh, you know, one thing that we point to, like you were talking about on the other slide, is we we now know that there are lots of health impacts. Um, you know, when when we first started learn, um, you know, when smoking was new, you know, they thought that that was healthy, and and there it turns out there's lots of carcinogens um, related to smoking, and it can cause uh, a, a plethora of health impacts. And you know, we feel like you know, oil and gas development is is pretty similar in that way where we are finding after, you know, a decade of research on fracking that, um, 
yeah, that, that this is, this is an issue. And you know what, Corey, when you restarted, I'm not sure if your recording stopped, but I'm going to go ahead and make sure my recording is happening and we're going to, yeah, because I, I think that that might be a, an issue. Um, so, okay. So Russell, go ahead. We're recording again, um, despite the, the technical issues. Um, so go <laughs> ahead and, and we'll, we'll work together to, to make sure that this is working. All right. This will be a good place to, uh, do the recording. Um, David, did you raise your hand? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. Um, I wanted to to make a comment and ask, um, isn't one of the reasons why um, we're just learning the negative impacts of fracking is because the solution that the industry uses is proprietary and they because it's proprietary, they don't disclose what those chemicals are that they're using. Yes, that was a big, that's a big component in the water contamination mm -hmm. aspect of this. And those chemicals that you're talking about, like, if that's an excellent question. Um, those are the corrosives. After electrocuting the ground, that's what they inject into the ground to you know, keep. And it's like, it's, it's not that complicated to think about. Like, there's shale underground, and in order to get that to start releasing its gas, you have to use abrasive chemicals um to to have that reaction begin and again this is you know the secret coca-cola formula um other gas company if they have some crazy concoction that is more abrasive than someone else's they don't want to reveal that information um but also from a common sense perspective that should be sort of scary because all these companies are competing for the nastiest chemical concoction possible it's mm -hmm. going to be as abrasive as possible. Um, but today we're mostly talking about air pollution. But yes, that is a big water pollution okay. point. And um, unfortunately, the way the gas industry deals with their water waste is really uh, reckless and probably a good subject for a different webinar. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I want to mention too, there's not just the stuff that um, the companies are adding, but also I think what we're really talking about too tonight is what comes up with the methane. It's not just methane. Mm -hmm. There's other stuff, right? There's like um, Russell was mentioning, me mentioning those carcinogens. So that's really what we're talking about here. Like those carcinogens that are coming up with the methane, um, because those are just, um, you know, those are just uh, sometimes naturally occurring things that that you know they, they there's no control over um we're not just mining for gas it's not just methane that's going to come up it's a lot of other stuff that's coming up out of that well uh, and there's no way to predict it there's no way to to get a chemical compound you know chemical analysis before you before you drill and frack that well it just can't be done um so yeah so russell tell me about this image here and um what's going on in this slide Sure. Well, just like you're saying, these are the cancer risks from the exact chemicals that you're talking about. Um, and unfortunately, there are more people um, to move along. This uh, graphic in the upper left is from the same idea that's in this slide. There are more people exposed to increased cancer risks because of the gas industry in Pennsylvania than any other state in the country. Wow. Um, and this is from a Clean Air Task Force study, uh, fossil fumes, uh, that'll be linked in this. Um, and But if you also just Google that, it will come up. Um, it's a really bracing study to read. And it's important to think about this because it's not just, you know, it matters how many people are living by these sites. Um, it just really matters. Um, so again, when we think about the state of Pennsylvania, you know, some of these places are sparsely populated, but not many of them, um, and certainly more populated than the other gas drilling regions across the country, uh, Wyoming, North Dakota, the parts of Texas. Um, in terms of how much gas you're drilling and how many people live around it, um, Pennsylvania is really number one in that scary category particularly southwestern PA, and if you look at the graphic in the upper left, um, you know, that darker purple is, you know, 
the highest cancer risk for the for the most people in the country. Um, and then in the lower right, it's a great graphic from one of our partner groups, Frack Tracker, uh, who we work with often. Uh, really great organization, really great tool to find out what's going on in the gas industry around you. Uh, before I jump into something else, Jillian, did you? Yeah, there was a great question in the chat, and I think that Chelsea already gave Sandy the link. But Chelsea, would you mind just popping the link in the chat for uh, for folks? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we got a great group here um, helping us out on the on the technical side. So thank you so much. Um, go ahead, Russell. Okay, great. This is a little um, just a side. When you're looking at that map in the lower right. Um, you see these two kind of big clusters of gas drilling, one in southwestern PA and one in northeastern PA. And it's sort of an interesting, when, when, when we talk about, you know, Jillian, you said it uh, perfectly earlier, we really don't know what is coming out of the ground until we take it out of the ground. And even then, it's kind of hard to figure out. Um, and even within the state of Pennsylvania, just like like you might be aware that there are two distinct kinds of coal in the state of Pennsylvania. There's anthracite in the Northeast and then bituminous in the Southwest. There are two different types of gas uh, that come out of the ground. In the Northeast, it's what's described as a drier gas. And in Southwest, it's what's described as a wetter gas. Um, and that wetter means there's more of these other things. Um, in the Northeast, it's sort of, a, there's, a, there's a larger methane content and less of the other things um, in the Southwest where, you know, where you all are, um, there's more of this, you know, what I'll simply describe as other stuff, um, natural gas, liquids, ethane, propane, other things. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the plastics industry has taken off so much in Southwest PA is because the gas that's coming out um, has more of those chemicals like ethane and propane. Yes, Jen? Yeah, and Russell, we have a great question in the chat, and um, I'm not sure if this is like pertaining to what we're talking about necessarily in the webinar, but um, any thoughts on the gas methane being more radioactive in the Marcellus than other regions? What, um, when the gas is combusted, the radiation is not destroyed and may actually be more concentrated. Um, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, radiation is a big issue with with uh, shale gas, and from from what I know, and and Russell, I don't know if you have other information, but from my knowledge, um, the reason why this this shale gas and the shale is is radioactive is because it once was an ancient seabed, and this was when our Earth did not have its protective barrier. So the radiation from the sun is actually you know beaming down on that ancient seabed, and that that's why the radioactivity is there. It's naturally occurring. But then when we when we frack, we do what's called, it, it turns it to this technically enhanced radioactive material. Um, so there's a, a great study called the T-norm study. Um, and that's a, that's a great point of reference if you want to learn more about radiation. Um, and you are right, you know, when it's combusted, um, you know, it can, it, it, it cannot be destroyed like that. Um, usually, though, you're, you're finding that um, the, the radiation is, um, is found in the particles, you know, the, the, uh, a lot, it, it sticks to materials. So it's found in the drill cuttings, it's found in the sediment, things like that. Um, and when, we, when it's, you know, when it, we emit radio to, radium 226 and 228, it becomes radon from my understanding. So we, we have radon in the air. Now in open spaces, radon is easily um, dispersed, but, you know, all, radon's a big issue in homes um, in particular uh, in, in the Marcellus and other formations in Pennsylvania, we have a big radon problem. Uh, did you have anything else to, to share there, Russell? Uh, other than Pennsylvania is the number one radon state. That's all I was going to add to that. And it's a funny, um, <laughs> the State Department of Environmental Protection, that's the really big issue that they like to talk about a lot. And it's kind of funny because it is a, um, it's one environmental problem that they can talk about and there's no sort of guilty party. 
which is, I think, one of the reasons why they like to talk about it so much is because, oh, well, it's just there. We don't know how it got there. There's no one to blame for it. Um, but yes, I believe that is true when the, uh, the radon is how I know that that's true. Um, so, okay, we're going to... Um, we're going to sort of go quickly and it's going to get a little more technical. So please feel free to um, ask some questions. That's the whole point is to make sure y'all understand this. Um, so this is the first, you know, when we're looking at this EPA methane rule, we're looking at different pieces of technology at the gas well site and different practices. Um, and I'll explain later, but one of the big issues that this rule is trying to tackle more focused on uh, oil drilling in Texas, Wyoming, and North Dakota, and other states, is the gas that comes with oil drilling. Um, for years, this gas was just a waste product that the industry was trying to get rid of. Um, and now the EPA is trying to require companies to recover as much of it as possible. And, you know, that's a big part of this rule in general is that, you know, it's it's very common sense. It's not, you know, super hippy-dippy environmentalism. We're just asking the gas industry to keep its own product, uh, which is kind of a funny position for environmentalists to be in. Like, we just want you to keep your gas so that you can sell it. Um, so that associated gas, and we'll talk about the differences between Pennsylvania and other places. Uh, we'll also talk about pressure control pneumatic devices which is one of the really, really big steps this rule is taking. Um, it is requiring zero emission pneumatic devices. And I'll explain what that means later, but it's an easily available technology upgrade um, that really just needs to be made. And unfortunately, until this rule is finalized, the state of Pennsylvania will continue to permit uh, the use of what's called intermittent bleed pneumatic devices at gas well sites and compressor stations. And Jillian mentioned our work around the J.B. Tonkin station earlier. Um, a big part of my job is individual comments on individual wells and compressor stations in the state of Pennsylvania. And since this rule has been published and proposed in the last few years, we have been pleading with the state Department of Environmental Protection to heed the call from the federal government um, and acknowledge some of the new research. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Storage tanks are a big source of emissions, um, and we'll talk about why that's important as well. And then just the general leaks, uh, Jillian mentioned compressor stations. Um, you know, when we compress gas to put it in pipelines, that's what causes leaks. Um, you know, gas just comes out of every facet of the industry, and more inspections are an attempt to deal with that. Um, so again, this is a different way to look at that chart. Um, this is from, this is another great study from one of our partners, the Clean Air Task Force. So they sort of divided up the different types of technology um, and how much methane they produce. Um, you'll see venting and flaring from oil wells kind of down low on this list, uh, but that is just because this list is just looking at methane. Um, and when you burn the gas that is emitted during oil drilling, it doesn't produce methane, it produces other pollutants. Uh, so that's why it's sort of down low on this list. But if we were looking at other pollutants, flaring would probably be higher because it creates, still releases um, some of the volatile organic compounds and some of the hazardous air pollutants. Um, but again, we see storage tanks. And to cut to um, something that will come up later, you see Clean, Clean Air Task Force talking about how we need to control emissions from storage tanks that release over two tons of VOCs per year. EPA is looking at storage tanks that release over six tons of VOC per year. Uh, so that's already an improvement that they could make. They could lower that number and then look at more storage tanks. We just talked about pneumatic equipment, and um, we'll talk more about, you know, just looking for leaks and improperly functioning equipment is one of the really big parts of this rule and the way that we can reduce gas pollution from this industry. And then well completions is a big thing. Tapping wells, I'm sure that you've thought about what we call a abandoned and orphaned wells. In the Pennsylvania has more orphaned wells than any other state in the country. We've been drilling for gas and oil just 
for an incredibly long time in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the really great things this rule is already proposing to do um, is require air monitoring at gas wells until they are capped. Uh, so it is will hopefully eliminate the practice of well abandonment with that major stride. So that in and of itself is a great reason to support this rule that they will require monitoring at wells until they are plugged. Um, so again, this is a real uh, chart from a real air permit that I was evaluating. This is the Brigage Compressor Station um, in the area. And again, I just like, you know, if you look at this chart and then look at this real permit document, it's kind of the same thing. They divide up the different equipment at the site. They all release different amounts of pollutants. Um, some are VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Some are nitrogen oxides, NOx. Um, and again, you see the pneumatics, flares, venting, fugitives. Um, this is how, you know, the government and people like myself evaluate pollution from sites like this and all their different uh, pollution sources. So again, what is this rule? Why is it happening? Um, and it's funny, in this slide mentions November of 2021, which is when this rule was proposed, but a version of it was actually proposed in 2015 at the tail end of the Obama administration and then reversed during our previous president. Um, so this rule that came out in November of 2021 was actually in the making six years prior uh, and was kind of stumbled during the sort of gap in environmental regulation that took place between 2016 and 2020. Um, so again, we're talking about reducing all these different types of air pollution um, and its existing sites. The original rule called a new source performance standard that was proposed in 2015 only looked at new facilities. And now we're finally talking about new and existing facilities. Um, and again, one of the really big steps forward, this rule is gonna allow third parties to submit air pollution data to the state and to EPA and then require that companies address those leaks um, and those emission events gathered from third parties. Um, and this rule does not exempt low producing wells like Pennsylvania's state rule that was just finalized does. Um, and EPA even found that, uh, so that low producing well number that they, uh, the state was dealing with where they sort of had this idea that, well, if a, if a site that doesn't produce that much gas or oil, it must not be creating that much pollution. Uh, but EPA actually found that be total nonsense. The amount of gas or oil that you're extracting just has nothing to do with the amount of air pollution that your site might create. Um, so again, one of the really big uh, pieces of progress from this rule is EPA has now concluded the thing that dictates how much air pollution is at a site is the amount of various pieces of equipment, not how much gas or oil that you're drilling for. Um, so again, some really important steps here. Um, and the state really can't be stressed. And I think low producing wells produce something like half the methane pollution that we're witnessing. So to emit the sources of half of the pollution that we're dealing with is just really wild. Um, and again, it's one of the reasons why we need this rule as soon as possible, because for the next four years or so, which is how long it's going to take for this rule to really get implemented, uh, these low, these so-called low producing sites will not be inspected as we are governed by the state rule. Um, so again, we talked about why that's important. Um, and again, when we talk about these inspections that are happening, this is an area of uh, a definite improvement and probably a good piece of discussion. Um, government is really good at making very simple things very complicated. And uh, one of the ways it does that is these what they're calling an AVO inspection, audio visual olfactory. Sounds very complicated. It is not. Audio visual olfactory means a person is walking onto a site, looking, hearing, and smelling. That is literally what that means. Um, why they don't just say that, I don't know. Um, and that's going to be a really important part of this rule, is how are we going to be evaluating these reports from industry? 
where they write like, okay, now you're, you're requiring inspections at all sites now, which is great. But some of those inspections will just be AVO. So what's going to prevent industry from just saying, yeah, I went there and I didn't smell anything and I didn't see anything. Um, so it's something really important and a problem that we're probably going to be dealing with five to 10 years from now in evaluating these individual reports. So again, I mentioned that, you know, now EPA has finally got around to the idea, the more polluting technology at a site, the more inspections they will require. Um, and it actually sort of goes up on a sliding scale where if it's what's called a wellhead only site, it requires an AVO inspection once every quarter, once every three months. If you have two or more wellheads, it is a AVO inspection every three months and then a optical gas imaging inspection, which we'll show videos of later twice a year. Um, and then if you have a few more polluting pieces of equipment, it's gonna require optical gas imaging inspections every quarter and then AVO once a month. Um, so it sort of goes up like that on a sliding scale. Um, and again, we mentioned that this rule will hopefully eliminate the practice of well abandonment by requiring um, air monitoring until wells are plugged. So again, we've been saying pneumatics a bunch. So what does that really mean? Um, and again, one of the really big parts of this rule is pressure. When gas comes out of the ground, it's at a certain pressure. In, in, in order to get it to your home, it has to be at a certain pressure. So how do they regulate that pressure? They use pneumatic controllers and devices. Um, and it's just, you see that valve actuator at the bottom of this slide that opens and closes to regulate the pressure of gas coming out of the well. Um, and previously the gas industry actually was using gas itself to regulate that pressure. And when it got too great, they would just release it, which created these massive air pollution incidents. Uh, but thankfully, um, alternatives are available. You can use electricity or compressed air to do the exact same thing without releasing gas to control the pressure. Um, so again, the, the new EPA rule is gonna require that all pneumatics be zero emitting. Um, and there are several ways to do that. Um, and this chart, these two charts, is how EPA figured that out. The chart at the top is how these pneumatic devices are supposed to work in that, you know, you see these big jumps of uh, emissions, um, and that is, the, that is supposed to be the opening and closing of those valves. You get a short release of pollution, and then the valve closes, and then nothing comes out. It releases again, uh, short release of pollution, and then it closes and nothing comes out. Uh, but with research, EPA found that as a device does that, the seal on it degrades over time. So the actually, so the device ceases to close at a certain point and just starts slowly leaking air pollution out. Um, so yeah, again, the chart, the chart at the top is how it's supposed to work. And the chart at the bottom is how the EPA found that these devices were actually working. Um, and this is a picture of an actual uh, one of these air-driven pneumatic devices, and the gentleman is gesturing towards a tank of compressed air um, that is now regulating the pressure at this well in Colorado. Pennsylvania is a little behind these upgrades in technology. Um, but that's all it is, attaching a tank of compressed air where you would formally be using gas and creating a ton of air pollution. So again, we've talked about why this rule is good, but it still can be improved. And one of the really important aspects of this rule is that EPA has said that, you know, you're supposed to capture all the gas that comes out during oil drilling. You're supposed to capture all of the gas that comes out during a blowdown, which I'll explain later. Uh, but they've allowed gas companies to apply and say, well, it's just not possible for me to capture this gas. I just can't do it. Um, so EPA has sort of does what a lot of government rulemakings do. They've left a few things vague to be figured out later. So we're demanding that EPA figure out this stuff now 
Um, and just for my job as a person who evaluates governmental regulations, um, anytime you see that little exemptions, it's a major red flag. Um, so we really want more information from EPA about well, what does possible really mean in these situations? Um, and one of the funny sort of, I'll say absurd parts of this rule is that, you know, by definition, all of these sites are taking gas and putting it into the assembly line of gas, uh, you know, the pipelines, you know, that whole process. Um, so how could you really claim you can't control the gas that's coming out of the site when the whole point is to control the gas coming out of the site. Um, so we really want some more information from EPA on that. Jillian? Yeah, I just wanna mention here on the slide, we have a good definition of what a blowdown is. So if you haven't heard that, that term before, um, you know, a blowdown is this, this purposeful venting of the gas into the atmosphere. Usually this happens for, you know, maintenance or, um, you know, something where they have to relieve the pressure. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because if you're like, well, I don't know what a blowdown is, or, or I'm not really sure what they're talking about. Just, um, you can, we got a great definition here for you. Um, and so this happens all the time. Um, and it's not just methane that comes out. Of course, the, all those other things come out too, um, but which, which can be harmful, but just want to mention it. And so it seems like this methane rule is actually going to help with, um, with this, this issue. Um, and um, so um, that's exciting. To yeah, me. And it's particularly important in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and it's sort of the reverse of what happens nationwide when you're drilling for oil in Texas or, or North Dakota, gas accumulates in that drilling process and you have to get rid of it. The opposite occurs in Pennsylvania. When you're drilling for gas, oil starts to come in. Well, they, it's not technically oil. It's what they refer to as natural gas liquid. Sort of liquid substances yeah. start to be in your gas well. Um, in order to get rid of those substances, they just start openly venting gas. Um, and if you live near gas infrastructure, this is the real hazard. These are short-term hazards um, that can cause real public health problems. Um, and in general, in sort of air pollution re regulation, short-term events are sort of the hardest to control for because a lot of gas, a lot of pollution regulations are based on, you know, tons per year. How many tons of pollution did you release over 12 months? Um, but as a human being, you know, you don't take pollution in over year-long periods if there's an extreme event happening even for, you know, a few minutes in your neighborhood that can cause real problems for you. So the um, reducing pollution from blowdowns and eliminating that practice um, is something that is really going to protect individual public health. Just yeah, and, and Russell, we have a really good question here. Um, why is PA behind other states in technology? Aren't wells here newer? <laughs> So I, I would say yes and no. There are some really old wells that we have here, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, there, there are a lot of new ones, but there are also a lot of old ones. Um, and, you know, Pennsylvania is just more entrenched in the fossil fuel industry than a state like Colorado is. Um, there, I, I, It's hard for me to explain why Pennsylvania is the way it is, but um, we're just a like little... Yeah, I feel like that's a call to action to call your state legislator because um, they're they're the reasons why we're behind, yeah. right? And then say like, I don't want to, why do I have to live in the state that's waiting on other states to do? Like it's- That's right. Um, why, why do we have to wait? And then God forbid you mention what California is doing and then people are like, oh, well, that's very different. But um, anyway. All right. So this is um, what we've been talking about in terms of a blowdown and trying to release the liquids that accumulate in a gas well. Um, there is available technology. This is from an, a paper that EPA put out in 2016. Um, so this technology is widely available and this plunger can remove the liquids in a gas well without releasing that air pollution. Um, so this is a nice piece of technology that would really reduce air pollution 
and I think it should be required at all gas wells. Um, and again, there's going to be this application process where a company is going to say, well, it's impossible for me to use this. Um, and we want EPA to come in and say, I'm not so sure about that. Let's give it a try. Um, and one of the really interesting parts of this rule um, is in the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in August. There's $1.5 billion allocated in a methane emissions reduction program um, that is going to be at the EPA's disposal. Um, they're still trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do with this funding, um, but it could certainly be used for more air monitoring and significant pollution reductions. Um, so again, if you're talking to your elected official and they're saying, oh, well, this is going to cost us a lot of money, remind them that there's $1.5 billion um, available for this work. Um, and again, uh, this is the kind of stuff that they could be doing with that $1.5 billion. Um, we mentioned uh, optical gas imaging. Um, this is a good time for a plug. Um, Jillian, what is that webinar with Melissa next week? Yes, uh, so we do have a, um, a lunch and learn scheduled with Melissa Ostroff from uh, Earthworks, and uh, that's next week. You can visit our webpage to our events page um, for details on that. We do have another question in the chat as well, so this is a great time to break. Um, are there any kind of analysis out there um, about the development of blue hydrogen um, will increase the air toxic, uh, toxic exposures of folks in PA? Uh, yeah, we got, <laughs> I think that's a, a, a definitely a, a different topic. And yeah, we've, we've got some information on that. Yeah, I believe actually there was a different organization had a webinar this afternoon about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So blue hydrogen is, you know, the quick version of hydrogen. You're just turning one source of energy into a different source. Um, in Pennsylvania, so that's uh, that whole blue, green, pink, all of that. Um, so green hydrogen. Okay, so let's back up for a second. Uh, this, is, this is a great question. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with hydrogen. Um, it is kind of a, a sort of new version of nuclear power uh, that involves splitting an atom, but the atom that you're happening to split just happens to be water. So that's how you're getting that hydrogen. Um, you're not boiling water, you're superheating it till that atom splits into oxygen and hydrogen. Water is H2O, um, and hydrogen can be used as a fuel. It is highly flammable, possibly a little too flammable, um, which is one of the reasons why it's just bizarre that people would think of fueling cars with it, because you would literally be driving around with a big compressed air tank of hydrogen in your trunk. Um, but again, probably a different webinar. Um, so the blue hydrogen would be using, so again, we're talking about superheating. You can get the energy for that heat from any source. Um, but unfortunately in Pennsylvania, we're sort of leaning towards natural gas as the source of that heat. Um, so that's where the blue comes in. Green hydrogen would be hydrogen created with solar power blue hydrogen being hydrogen created with gas. Um, so the short answer to the question is, if Pennsylvania gets into the hydrogen game, that'll mean a lot more gas extraction. Yeah. Um, so all the same things we've been talking about increased. Yeah, and actually one of our state senators here in Westmoreland County is trying to push for a hydrogen hub here in Westmoreland County. So uh, we've got our eye on this there. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Chelsea to put uh, a drop a link in the chat we had a really great lunch and learn last year with Orvi, that's Ohio River Valley Institute. They have done some amazing research on hydrogen. Uh, and so uh, when Chelsea finds that link, she's gonna go ahead and pop it in the chat for folks so they can learn more about hydrogen. All right, so we've got some some photos here. We've got some, some gas imaging here. Um, what's next for our discussion on methane, Russell? Sure, we are wrapping up. We're a little bit short on time, so maybe we should not show this whole video. Yeah. Let's just show it for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so again, this is what we're talking about, optical gas imaging, uh, FLIR cameras. Um, yeah, you should really go. Melissa Ostroff is fabulous. You should really go to that event next week. 
um, and she'll talk all about how we visualize air pollution um, from sites using optical gas imaging cameras. And again, the big takeaway in terms of the methane rule is more optical gas imaging rather than audiovisual olfactory inspections. Uh, more optical gas imaging, and then more funding to train communities in this. It could be a really, and this is actually a good segue into the um, the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so the yes, the super emitter response program. Um, that's EPA is sort of hedging their bets in terms of how impactful communities will be um, in terms of the implementation implementation of this rule, but we want a big chunk of that one and a half billion dollars um, to train communities in optical gas imaging so as many people as possible um, have the capability to use this technology and can reduce air pollution in their communities. Um, we've talked about we've talked about a lot of the things seen here. Um, and I want to go to this community outreach part, which is a really, really important part of this rule. So the way this works is, and this is a good uh, part to conclude, um, this rule will probably get, this rule is up for comment right now. The comment deadline is February 13th. After that, the rule will probably be finalized, hopefully within 2023. Um, the final rule is published by EPA within the year then states get four and a half, then there'll be a four and a half year timeline before it's implemented. States will get 18 months to write a plan, their plan to do this rule. And then there's a three year sort of back and forth with all of this. Um, so EPA has said, when states are coming up with their state impl implementation plans, which they will have that 18 months to create, they have to do community outreach. So how are they going to evaluate that? Are they going to reject state plans because they didn't do enough community outreach? Um, and what I really hope the state of Pennsylvania does is when they're doing this required community outreach, letting people know that there's going to be programs for communities to jump into. Um, and here's funding that we have for you to get trained on that. Um, so I'm sure that you'll be hearing from me again in 18 months or 36 months about how that whole process is going. Um, but yeah, really, as much as we can right now, letting EPA know that we're really concerned with the community outreach that our state is or isn't going to do as they develop their plan. Um, and then one of the, my, my real concerns about this four and a half year timeline, we talked about how they're going to try to eliminate the practice of well abandonment. Um, but it's a little frightening for me to think about like the day before they finalize this rule, you know, large amounts of wells are abandoned because companies see that requirement on the horizon. So how is EPA and DEP going to deal with that? Um, I think this is probably, yes. So there, um, this is how you should all should uh, fill out protect PTs. Comment to the EPA. They make it super easy for you. Um, Clean Air Council right now is circulating a sign-on letter for academics and health professionals. Um, so we can tell EPA that all these super smart people care about this rule. Um, so if you know any academics or health professionals or are one yourself, we would love for you to sign on to our comment. Um, yeah, and this is our information. I'm gonna stop. Um, yeah. I'll give people a second and leave our information up. Um, if there are final questions, I, I know that was a little technical, but I, there's trying to split the difference between it being technical and it being some information that you could use. Yeah, I think, I think Russell, you did a great job of, um, making sure that we understand the technical, um, with, with, with the other, you know, what we have to know about the rule. And so maybe we can go back one slide, just, um, just a really quick uh, to make sure. Oh, go one one more the other way. Up oh, there we go. Okay, so um, you know we're going to push the EPA 
to support and strengthen this, this proposal because this rule is really important, um, particularly if you live in the shale fields like we do. Um, you know, you can sign up for your comment here. Uh, this is also on our website. Um, so protectpt.info, uh, methane comment. Um, there's also great resources and information. You can use the information in this webinar. You can use the information in uh, Clean Air Council's comment. Uh, and you can call us or, or, or email us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we can flip back to that slide. Uh, so, so if you have questions that uh, while you're um, writing your comment, and I will say with our comment, we have some standard language that um, thanks to our friends at Cleaner Council and other folks that have come up with some great um, standard comment language uh, for, for the EPA. And then we're going to have to, you know, keep up with this and make sure that once the rule is um, finalized, once the comment period is finalized, that, that our state does its job um, to make that plan and our state does its job to uh, do the outreach. Um, so this is certainly not done uh, and, and uh, with the comment period, but Russell, that comment period, it ends what, February, is it 13th? February 13th, which is a February Monday. February 13th is the last day to comment. So you have a, you know, a couple weeks here, uh, right before, um, right before Valentine's Day. And um, maybe you can um, uh, get uh, get yourself a Valentine of the love of clean air. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we love clean air. Uh, it's it's great for our lungs, <laughs> and uh, we want to make sure that our our air um, it gets cleaner here in PA certainly. <laughs> Because uh, especially with new compressor stations coming in, I know I know there are folks in Elizabeth that are here. Thanks so much for joining us today. I know you guys are. Are, have a new compressor station um, in your neck of, uh, neck of the woods. Um, and there are certainly lots of, of new compressor stations all over the shale fields uh, because it's necessary for the companies for their build out. Um, so yeah, let's see if there's any other questions or, or comments before we hop off tonight. I wanna thank Russell for, for joining us and, and sharing his wonderful knowledge with us. And uh, don't forget to comment folks and uh, you can find all the information on our website. Yeah, and I will say that there, um, and thank Protect VT for putting this all together. Um, it's easy to forget, and we've talked about a lot tonight about, you know, well, tell your elected official this and tell your elected official that. One of the really great ways to start that conversation and something people don't really think to do, let your elected official know that you commented on this rule to let them know that you're you're active politically, you're doing stuff, you're at your, you know, don't start the conversation by asking them for something. Let, let them know what you've been doing so that when you want to, you know, do some complaining later on, you sort of started it with, you know, your own action. That's right. And if if Kim Ward is your <laughs> state uh, <laughs> senator, <laughs> as she is to ours, uh, you can let her know that we're we're not interested in hydrogen either. <laughs> and it's so, so like we talked about that billion and a half in the methane emissions reduction program. Like we're talking about billions in state and federal subsidies, just giving it away to the gas industry for that hydrogen hub. So it's you know, again, this is this is y'all's money. Yeah, there's so many other worthy things we could do with our money, right? Uh, <laughs> and then, like, it's, yeah, I could talk about that hydrogen all day. Like, it, you're literally just <laughs> turning one, the, the the blue height, you're turning gas into another fuel, creating a ton of air pollution in the process for what is basically a lateral move. Yeah. All right. I got a kiddo here that wants my attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off for tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we had a really great crowd, and we look forward to to seeing you again at our at our lunch and learn um, next Tuesday. And uh, yeah, at at future events. Have a great one. Bye everyone. Good night everyone. <laughs>